Welcome to AP Chemistry at Honda High School. Today we'll be starting Chapter 15, which deals with chemical equilibrium. Now, chemical equilibrium uh, is the beginning of a multi-chapter sequence, all revolving around the same concept, which is the concept of equilibrium. Equilibrium is one of the major areas of study for AP Chemistry, and it is one of the single most important for the AP test as well. Every single year, there will always be an FRQ question related to equilibrium, and it's always question number one. While sometimes it contains components other than equilibrium, one will always be an equilibrium question. On the multiple choice portion of the AP test, four of the 75 questions will be dealing with chemical equilibrium. A lot of those are dealing with the concept of Le Chatelier's principle. So this is something that is heavily represented on the AP test, and there are a lot of different aspects of equilibrium. This is just one. This chapter is getting into basic equilibrium. At chemical, uh, a chemical equilibrium occurs when a reaction and its reverse reaction proceed at the same rate. So in this reaction system between N2O4 and the brown gas NO2, in a sealed system, eventually the rates of this reaction forward and reverse will become equal, and at that point we're at chemical equilibrium. So as a system approaches equilibrium, both the forward and the reverse reactions are occurring. At equilibrium, the forward and reverse reactions are proceeding at the exact same rate. Now, one thing to be careful with in this diagram, this is actually showing a very, very rare event. It's because of the type of reaction system we're looking at here. But normally, your rates aren't going to... Um, it, it, normally, you're looking at a concentration time data, not a rate time data. So don't confuse this with the type of graph we normally see. Here is showing what's happening with rate over time. So the substance N2O4 was our reactant. And at the beginning, it's going to have a very high rate as we use up the components of uh, N2O4. The concentration starts to drop, and the rate starts to drop. On the flip side, we have the product NO2. At the beginning, its rate is 0 because at the beginning, we, in essence, have no product. But as we start to make product, the reverse rate starts to increase. And eventually what happens these two, uh, is these two things become equal to each other. In a rate time graph at equilibrium, those two would be equal. Concentration time, they become constant, but you'll notice the two aren't normally equal. So be careful in assuming that all the graphs we look at are rate time graphs. Most of the time they're concentration time graphs, like the one that you're seeing here. So notice when you hit equilibrium, so once your equilibrium is achieved, the amount of each reactant and product remains constant because the rates are happening at equal and opposite rates. So as many reactants are going to products, as products are going to reactants, and at that point your concentrations become constant. Concentration being constant is not the same as concentration being equal. So notice these two lines here when we reach our equilibrium. So at this point, concentration stops changing, so in order to equilibrium, these two things are not equal. So it would be rare that our concentrations actually become equal, but it would be true that our rates always become equal at equilibrium. Now as you can see, the ratio of NO2 squared to N2O4 remains constant at this temperature no matter what the initial concentrations of NO2 and N2O4 are. So basically, regardless of what our initial concentrations are, at all of these different points, when we take a look at the value over here, which is looking at the relationship between NO2 squared and N2O4, those two things, um, regardless of their initial concentration, eventually end up with the exact same ratio. So they have a constant ratio. That K is one of the things we're going to be looking for. That is our equilibrium constant we'll be talking about later. Now this is the data from the last two trials from uh, the data table on the previous slide. Now, remember on this slide, we had a series of different experiments. If we take a look at experiment three and experiment four from the last uh, slide, it doesn't really matter what we start with in terms of our N2 and H2, um, or whether we even start with N3 because we have two reactants and a product, regardless of what we start with, eventually we're going to reach equilibrium. And under the same conditions here, we end up with the same concentrations in these cases. So it doesn't really matter whether we start with N2 and H2 or we start with NH3. Eventually, we're going to reach equilibrium, and the proportions of all three are going to be the same at equilibrium. So in order to reach equilibrium, 
one, the reaction must be reversible. Two, the system must be closed. Because what happens in a typical situation is one reaction is causing the other. Well, if any of your reactants or products are able to escape, that's going to affect the growth of one rate and the dropping of the other rate. So it must be a closed system. Most of the solution systems we look at basically are solutions. So even though it's in a beaker with no lid on it, it's a closed system from the viewpoint of liquids dissolved within uh, or the, uh, the substance is dissolved within the liquid. At equilibrium, the forward and the reverse rates are equal. Remember, that's the equal in equilibrium. Be careful, there's not a lot of things that are equal. But the one that is, is the forward and reverse rates. Concentrations, pressures, volumes, and temperatures all become constant. Not equal, but constant at equilibrium. And a particle ratio of concentration terms is constant. So basically, if we're looking at the ratio, a very specific ratio, of our products to reactants or reactants to products, we're going to end up with a constant number. So we, we can derive a constant relationship between reactant and product concentrations. Now, since in a system at equilibrium, uh, since in a system at equilibrium, both forward and reverse rates are being carried out, we write its equation with a double arrow. So, in every instance in this chapter, when we're talking about reactions, you'll notice that we use double arrows, and that's to imply that not only is N2O4 making two NO2s, but two NO2s are reacting back to make N2O4. So that denotes reversibility. So if our Ford reaction is N2O4 making two NO2s, the rate law from last chapter from this, so if this is an elementary step, the rate law of this reaction, unimolecular elementary reaction here, would be rate equals Kf times N2O4. Notice that's a little k from last chapter. That's our rate law constant. Now the reversible reaction, two NO2s becoming N2O4, if that's an elementary reaction, the rate law for this particular elementary step would be the rate of Kr, standing for the reverse reaction, times NO2 squared. So it's second order in, with respect to NO2. Now remember, at equilibrium, the two rates were equal. So that would mean the rate of F equals the rate of R. Well, we just established a second ago that the rate of F was Kf times N2O4 concentration, and the rate of R was Kr NO2 squared. So that means those two things must equal each other. Now, if you recall, a little bit ago, I showed a table in which the ratio of the concentrations expressed in a very specific way was constant. Now you can see why. If we write the equation in this form, putting our Ks on one side and our concentrations on the other, we end up with a rate constant over a rate constant, two constant values if we're not changing temperature, equaling NO2 squared over N204. Same relationship we looked at before. If we took the NO2 concentration from every experiment at equilibrium and the N204 at every experiment at equilibrium, squared the one and divided it by the other, it was a constant value. Well, the reason why is because this is a ratio of two constants, which would equal a constant. So the ratio of the constants is a constant at that temperature, and that expression becomes this. And this particular k value is not a lowercase k, it is an uppercase k. So uppercase k represents the equilibrium constant. So the ratio of the rate constants is a constant at that temperature, and its expression would be this. Now consider a general reaction that's reversible between A and B making C and D. The lowercase A's and B's, C's and D's are the stoichiometry mole amounts. The equilibrium expression, also called law of mass action for this reaction, would be in this form. Notice we've got products on top and reactants on bottom. I could spell. And we've raised each to the power of their coefficient. So the concentration of C would be raised to whatever is involved in the stoichiometry of this reaction. Um, substance D is raised to its power, uh, raised to the power of its stoichiometric number in the balanced equation. And the same would be true with our two reactants A and B. Every equilibrium re expression we look at is a concentration of products compared to a concentration of reactants. This is a core idea in every equilibrium set, uh, situation ever in chemistry. So remember, equilibrium constants are always a ratio of the products to the reactants. And that's a core idea we use many, many times. And this law, 
which is a fairly old law, is also referred to as law of mass action. So if they say anything about law of mass action, they're just talking about the equilibrium expression. It's the same thing. So here we have a reaction between NO becoming N2O and NO2, all being gases. If we write the K expression, it would be the products on top raised to the power of their coefficients. Coefficients in each case is a 1. So we don't need to write it, but in this case, it'd be a 1. Over the concentration of the reactants raised to its power, and, or raised to its mole amount from the balanced equation, that would be a 3. So that's how you write equilibrium expressions for any reaction. So if we have this reaction, notice these are all aqueous. The one above is all gases. You do it the same way. The K value, and since we're looking at concentrations, that's what that little C stands for. So whenever we're dealing with KCs, we're going to be using brackets, molarity concentration. It would be the product, remember, raised to the power of their coefficients, which would both be 1, over the reactants raised to the power of their coefficients, which in this case would be 1. So these would be how you would calculate equilibrium expressions and uh, show what the equilibrium constants are for a couple of different reactions. Now, these are what are known as homogeneous reactions. Everything in both was gases and aqueous. We'll talk in a little bit about what happens when they're heterogeneous. We get solids and liquids in there as well. Now, since pressure is proportional to the concentration for gases in a closed system, the equilibrium expression could also be written in forms of Kp. Now, notice we're dealing with pre's here. These are pressures, and these are always going to be pressures in atmospheres um, when we do these problems. So if you're not in atmosphere, get, get to atmospheres. And notice we don't have brackets anymore because we're not talking about concentrations. Now, one way to do this is to use parentheses. Another way to do it, which is very common as well, would just be to do it like this. So this basically means the exact same thing. So either of these basically are talking about the exact same thing. So if we have a gas system, not only can we write its Kc if we knew its concentrations, but if it's a gas situation we know the pressures of all the reactants and products, we can write its Kp. So for the reaction we were looking at on the previous page, Kp would equal the pressure of N2O times the pressure of NO2 over the pressure of NO cubed. So it's done in the exact same way as Kc. But now since we're dealing with pressure in atmospheres, we end up with P's. And notice we don't have brackets, so we're not talking about molarity. Now, there is actually a relationship between Kc and Kp. And that relationship really comes from the ideal gas law. If you recall, PV equals nRT. So if we rearrange it for pressure, we would get N over V times RT. Now, R and T are basically going to be constant in these situations. So we're going to be dealing with constant temperature. R is the ideal gas constant. So what that really means is um, pressure is going to be proportional to the N over V. And N over V is really our concentration. If you take the number of moles and divide it by your volume, you're going to get a mole per liter amount, which would be a molarity. So in this particular case, PV equals NRT becomes part, P-A-R-T. So there is a relationship between pressure and concentration, and that relationship deals with the proportionality here of RT. So it shouldn't surprise you that that's going to appear a second here. So if we plug this into the equilibrium expression for Kp for each of the substances, so we're going to take this and substitute it into this equation. What we end up with then is instead of Kp, we get Kc. And all of our RTs basically combined together, and what we find out here is Kp and Kc are related by this expression, Rt raised to the power of the change in number of moles. Now remember, it's always final minus initial when we're calculating change in N, change in T, and anything else. So in almost every single problem we look at, when you see the balanced equation and it's got gases, one of the things you should almost always first process is what's my delta N? So whenever you see a reaction and you see gases, think, OK, what's the delta N? may not be necessary, but it's a good starting point for most every reaction because it's something that is often used in different things. And delta N would be the moles of products minus the moles of gases of our reactants. Now, the R in this is always going to be our 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres, and that locks us into basically always dealing with pressure in atmospheres in this chapter. So hopefully the book is kind.
and, or I'm kind, and your pressures will be in atmospheres. If they're not, you need to convert to atmospheres in order to use this. So the R we're going to use here is not the 8.31 like we've used in the past few chapters where we were dealing with energies. Now we're going to use 0 0.0821 because we're dealing with liter atmospheres, atmosphere situations. Now one thing I want to mention here because this is a favorite on a B test and it might appear on my test as well. There is a relationship between KP and KC and that's RT to the power of the change in the number of moles of gas. But when could these things be equal to each other? So when does KP actually equal RC? Because it can happen. Well, think about it. If delta N is 0, RT to the 0 power would become 1, and then KP would equal KC. So that's an important relationship to understand intuitively because, hint, it comes up a lot on the AP test and potentially on my test as well. So when would KP equal KC? when there's no change in the number of moles of gases. They would be equal to each other. So far, we've only looked at homogeneous, which basically means all of the reactants and products were in the same state. And notice they were all gases, and they were all aqueous. So that's only one type of equilibrium system or situation that can come into play. We can also have heterogeneous equilibriums. And that's a slightly different animal. So there's a couple other things we need to take into account here. It's not very difficult. You just need to be aware of what your states are. So you'll notice all the equilibrium reactions that you do anything with in this chapter always have the states. That's because you must have it to deal with equilibrium. So does it make a difference if you have a solid or liquid? Well, I wouldn't be bringing it up if the answer to that wasn't yes. Now, what you need to understand here is the concentrations of liquids and solids can be obtained by dividing the density of a substance by its molar mass. If you take density of a substance divided by molar mass, you're going to get a ratio of moles to volume, which would be concentration in molarity. Well, both of these are constants. So liquids have a constant density if your temperature is not changing, and they have a constant molar mass if the identity is not changing. So both of these two things are going to be constant at a constant temperature. So fundamentally that, fundamentally that means their concentrations are going to be constant and we don't end up including them in the KS or in the, in the KC or KP expression. And you'll see why in a second here. So let's say here's a heterogeneous reaction between BBCl2, where it's dissolving in water to become aqueous Pb2 plus ions and two chloride ions. Now, in this particular situation, the Kc is going to be written as Pb2 plus times Cl minus squared. Both of these are aqueous, so they're not solids or liquids, so they're both going to appear in the equilibrium expression as is normal. Well, what happened to the PbCl2? Where did that go? We need to understand, remember, it's a ratio of products to reactants. And in this particular case, if we put in the PbCl2 here, and then we multiply both sides by the exact same thing, PbCl2 concentration, these would cancel. And now PbCl2 is over here. Now keep in mind, Kc is a constant. And the concentration of PbCl2 as a solid is a constant. So we can combine those two together to get our actual value. So solids and liquids are really incorporated in the idea of your K. So when you're writing equilibrium expressions, you don't, do not include solids and liquids in your, in your expressions, which means sometimes you may have no products that are gaseous or aqueous. So on top, you're going to have one. Sometimes you may have no reactants that are gases or aqueous. So sometimes on the bottom, you're going to have one. So what's on the numerator and denominator kind of depends upon what the species are. So you always have to be given states. In this particular reaction, we have a reaction between calcium carbonate that is becoming CO2 gas and calcium oxide. As long as some CaCO3 and CaO remain, so as long as some of those things are present in the system, the amount of CO2 above the solid is going to remain the exact same. Now, section 15.3 gets into meanings of K values. So I've showed you how to write a equilibrium expression. And if we knew our concentrations at equilibrium, we could plug those values in where the concentrations go, and we could calculate what the numerical value is. But what do those numbers mean? Well, remember, KEQ, or equilibrium constants, are a ratio of products to reactants. That's an important idea. Always, 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 always remember our K values deal with the concentration of products 
over the concentration of reactants. Keep that first and foremost in your mind at all times with equilibrium. Now, if the K value is much greater than 1, these double greater than signs just means much greater. So you're talking about something that's probably on the order of a thousand or larger, sometimes significantly larger. The reaction is going to be product favored. Because what's basically happening is if it's products over reactants and your K value is huge, that means the number on top compared to the number on the bottom must be significantly bigger. Which means at equilibrium, you must have a ton of products and very little reactants. And remember, we're talking about at equilibrium. When we talk about Ks, we're talking about a system at equilibrium. So if K is much greater than 1, it's going to be a product favored reaction equilibrium situation. And at equilibrium, the product is going to dominate in terms of overall concentrations. Now, if K is significantly less than 1, the reverse would be 2. Since it's products over reactants, the only way to get a very, very, very small number is if you have a lot of reactants versus very little product concentration. So the actual value of K, whether it's greater or less than 1, gives you an indication of whether it's a product-dominated or a reactant-dominated equilibrium system. And we deal with the extremes here. Notice we talked about much greater than one, much less than one. When you're a little bit above or below, it becomes a little less obvious, and you really have to evaluate what's happening with the concentration. So we deal with the extremes. Much greater than one, much less than one. We'd say product or reactant-dominated. Now, if the equilibrium expression depends upon how the reaction is written, change in the reaction will change the K value. Remember, we derive our K from the products over reactants type situation. So anything we can do to mess with those concentrations or to change where those concentrations appear, reactant and product side, is going to have an effect on our overall K. So what we're looking at here is how we can manipulate equations and how that ends up affecting our K value. So you should be able to predict how changes in reactions affect the equilibrium constant. So the equilibrium constant of a reaction in the reverse is the reciprocal of the equilibrium constant of the forward. Take a look at what happens in these two situations. This, N2O4 is our reactant, 2NO2 is our product. When we write our KC expression, products over reactants, product is 2, so we end up with NO2 squared on top and N2O4 on the bottom. Well, if we write the reverse reaction, now our NO2s are our reactant, so they're going to appear on the bottom squared. And N2O4 is our product, it's going to be on the top. These two things are simply the reciprocal of each other. So anytime you reverse a reaction, so the K with it written one way, so we're talking about the forward, if we flip it and we look at the reverse situation, the K of the forward is going to equal the reciprocal of the K of the reverse. So basically when we reverse reactions, we take the inverse or reciprocal of the old K value. So if you know the K of the forward, reaction expressed in forward to uh, reactant to product, uh, reactants are always considered on the left, um, it would have a K value. When we reverse it, it would be the inverse of the K. Another thing we can do is double everything in the reactant or cut. We can multiply everything by a constant. So the equilibrium constant of a reaction that has been multiplied by some number is the equilibrium constant raised to that power. So in this particular case, we have N2O4 becoming two NO2s. When we write the K expression, we get this value. And notice if we actually were at equilibrium in these values and plugged them in, so at 100 degrees Celsius, they tell us the K value would be 0.212. If we double the amounts, so now we're looking at increasing the amount to double whatever we had before. In this particular case, now we're going to have 2 N2O4 and 4 NO2. Well, that's going to be, in essence, what we had here squared. So you would take the old K value and square it. So when you double everything in a reaction, you increase the K value by a power of 2. Now, if you cut everything in half, so if we had half of this and only one of these, so if we cut it in half, then we would be raising it to the one-half power. So that would be square rooting it. So the new K value would be the square root of the old K value. If we tripled everything, we would be cubing everything. So whatever you multiply by is the power that you raise the old K value to equal the new K value. Another thing that can happen here is when we combine situations, it's kind of like uh, Hess's law that we looked at before, and when we were adding reactant 
uh, reaction mechanisms, elementary steps together to get an overall reaction. Well, we can combine reactions, so we can also combine k's. You just have to know how to do it. The equilibrium constant for a net reaction made up of two or more steps is the product of the equilibrium concentrations of the individual step. So in this particular case, we have a two-step reaction between these two substances. Well, if these two add to this, then these two k's multiply to this. So notice this was 2 and this was 4. If we found the K at this temperature for the bottom reaction, we would find out the K value ends up equaling 8. So the product of our individual Ks will equal our overall K. So when you add steps, you multiply Ks. And that finishes day one of notes for chapter 15. Hope you found everything nice and easy. See you on Monday.